Yeah. I've just got to pull up lyrics first. Whoa, that's a deep voice going on there. Now, I would be careful. I believe our live stream is on. So anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, good evening. We're glad to have you at Garner Free Will Baptist Church. Um, we are um, going to start off this evening with some music. Um, I, I kind of gave you a preview that we're going to have our song of the month. Um, and so we're going to kind of introduce it a little bit tonight. Now, um, this might be a little bit different because um, obviously if we don't have lyrics up, you're going to have to learn with me a little bit. So you can stay seated, um, but I want you to kind of work on this. This is um, what our verse for, uh, or our song for July is going to be. And I want you to be prepared for it on Sunday, okay? Because I don't like singing by myself. So uh, join with me. Um, it's a it's an anthem. I like this one because the verse is, or the chorus is exactly where I want to be. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that He will rise again. Oh, I believe in the name of Jesus. Okay, if you think you've got it now, stand up with me. And let's sing out really well. If you know it, great. If you don't, keep stumbling through it. it um, I believe in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that he'll rise again. And so it's the things we believe. Do you believe it? Now let's sing. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that he will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you, there's songs that's worth learning that are new. They're like, well, you know, it's not one that's out of our hymn book or it's not an old one, but I, I can't really say that I can find too many songs that are written nowadays that are that good. And so we're going to be singing it for the month of July as we talk about the anthem of the United States and we talk about this as our Independence Day and we'll start that on Sunday. But as we go through that, let's also as Christians, like, let's get our anthem together. We, we are the proud believers in whom God is. And what do we believe? We believe very, very much that. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We believe three in one, the Trinity. I believe in a resurrection. I believe we'll rise again. Are those important day, this day and age? Amen. Amen. And so let that be an anthem of the church. And now the verses are really good. That's really good. But the verses are really good. Let me read you the first one. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. This is theology. Um, I, somebody's asked me the question, like, what songs are, what do you think about this song, or what do you think about that song? And there's some that I'm like, that sounds good on the radio. That's not a church song. And to me, I, I put three categories. You get to hear from your pastor on this one. I put it, it's a good, good radio song. It's a good church song. Or it's a good singing song. And the difference is, it's okay listening to the car, but it really doesn't have a place in the church house. Okay, whatever that is, it's not wrong. It's just not glorifying to God like I want it to be. The ones that are ch good church songs are good specials. Like some of my wife sang, they're really good songs. They're really good car songs for us and good church songs that I, I'm like, you sing it again. Like sing that 50 times because that's a good song. But I don't want to lead that one in singing. That's not one that I feel like as a congregation that we're going to sing it the same way. 
And then there's there's the good church songs, the good let's sing it songs. Uh, Amazing Grace is always one of those. I don't care how you do it, whatever you do it with. Amazing Grace will always be one of those good singing songs. Um, you can put a little different tune to it. I, I wouldn't mind if somebody's got a banjo to start playing with a banjo. I like it from banjo to electric guitar, and I just can't play either one of those. Okay, I can play acoustic in the middle, but I can't play my electric, and I don't have a banjo. So I, one day I'll get one of those figured out. Um, if there's any question, my electric for sale. So if you want to buy an electric guitar, please see me after service. Um, anybody here play electric? Billy and Bobby, you already guys? Man, mm, now play the radio. Amen. Um, I can't play it either. I mean, I can play it like an acoustic, but I can't play it. So. Um, if you know anybody want one, it's for sale. It's on Facebook Marketplace. That's a pitch on our live stream. Anybody that's looking, you can uh, give me a call at um, 999-999-9999. That's my number online. Um, we're glad to have you here um, this evening, Lord. I, I don't I don't take this uh, uh, for granted that we get to gather together on a Wednesday. I think sometimes we get in our busyness and we forget how important it is to gather around God's Word. Amen? Um, and we got a lot coming up. I know some of you have got plans to travel. Um, over the 4th of July weekend, and um, you're going to be there, and we're going to pray in just a moment as we go into our prayer request time. We're going to pray for you. Tonight, we've got started our summer sing. Um, we had, I think it was 10 or 11 that had signed up for that. Amen? Um, and that is that is literally our preschool age up to ele- through elementary age, so they have two different groups going around. Um, and so be praying for them as they're starting. This is, um, again, a model of how we're moving back to a Wednesday night program that in the fall, Lord willing, it'll be a modified Awana course. And so as we do that, um, what of our emphasis? Teaching them the Word of God, amen? Memorizing the Word of God. Singing the Word of God. And then as kids, you're going to have a little bit of snack, a little bit of playtime. So let me give you by way of announcement, if you're interested in helping with our snacks, we have um, a couple of spots available where we're trying to make sure that we're not overloading anybody. We're trying to make sure everybody has a, a chance to chip in. We don't want everybody to miss on Wednesday night. Um, we want them to be able to worship and serve. It's both. And so um, if you're interested in helping out with that, um, you're not doing it by yourself. So no matter what you think, if it's like, well, I don't want to, like, what am I supposed to do with snacks? No, you're just supposed to go love on the kids. Trust me, snacks are easy. You bring them lollipops, they love you. Um, you bring them a healthy snack, they might not like you as much. My girls will eat vegetables um, to no end. So they're kind of the mixed bag. You never know. You might give them candy and they not like the candy you gave them and you might give them carrots and they not like carrots at that moment and, and they'll eat both of those at any time other than when you give them to them um, or at least that's when I give them to them so I don't know um, just pray for our workers as they're working with them we were down there cleaning this week and getting it ready for them and uh, praise the Lord it's all set up and uh, we've got some things moving forward and God's been good to us and so continue praying for that um, one final one because if you're looking at the timeline to Sunday is July 3rd, and we said the cutoff for signing up for um, the Mudcats baseball game, um, if we're going to get a box seat and do all that, is July 1st. And so that means if you're doing the math, you've got to be signed up by Friday. Is anybody else planning on being here on Friday? Okay, that's what I thought. So um, if you're going to plan on going, um, you need to let us know. If you don't, if you're not able, let's say you're watching live stream, you weren't here tonight, so you physically can't be here, and you say, I still want to go, um, you, you can let Michelle Holloman know or somebody else to text and get through the chain to get to Michelle Holloman and say that this is um, our interest, or we'll post her number online here in just a moment so everybody in telemarketer can call her. Um, okay, and that number is? I'm just kidding. Um, and so if you're interested in that, so we'll make a decision over the next week of what that looks like, whether we're going to be able to get the major box, the minor box, or no box at all. Um, and I prefer box just because I'd prefer the guy behind me not to be holding a big glass of yellow stuff. That I, yeah, I know what they tell me is in there, but I know what it smells like too, and that's a whole different thing. And so I kind of prefer if we're going to be together, let our kids be um, in a safe of environment. Somebody this week told me, said, do you shelter your kids? I said, absolutely, I do. Amen? Amen. Um, because why? They're not, they're not able at this point to discern the things of the world. And we need to shelter their hearts, their minds, and their bodies from what they're going to be exposed to. And yes, absolutely, I keep my kids as sheltered as I can. Um, that means today when the snake was rolling across the yard, my wife didn't let him go outside, uh, which it was just a black rat snake. But you tell my wife it was just a black rat snake. And if I was there, you would have told my shovel, but it was just a black rat snake. I'm like, well, now we have two pieces. And so it's a good black rat snake. Um, nobody's agreeing with me on this one. Um, but it's still alive right now. We've seen it twice now. 
Um, if he comes out a third time when I'm around, he might be decapitated um, because I believe the scripture that you should crush its head. I'm not Jesus, but I can at least do a portion of it. Amen. Nobody in here agrees with me on killing snakes, right? We need to cut to our prayer, prayer time. Um, and so we'll open up some prayer requests and what God's been doing. Remember.
you turn to your Bibles, we're back in Hebrews chapter 13. I think at the end of this week, we've got all we can get out of it. Um, I think, I mean, if I really wanted to, I could make one more sermon, but you know, I would have to like really stretch it thin. And so uh, maybe it's a sermonette at that point, and we, we're, we'll be done with Hebrews 13. What, Wednesday nights um, throughout the summer are going to be, what is the mission of the church? Why do we exist? Um, what are we trying to accomplish, and what is our goals? What are the, not ours, because we can come up with any organization, we can come up with what we want to do. We want to say, what is um, the qualities that God expects out of us? And truth be told, I, we could sum it up in one sermon. Y'all are like, well, why didn't we? Because I want you to see the big picture of what the church was doing in the New Testament. And when we back up and we say, okay, but what did Jesus actually tell them? And what did they execute on? What were their marching orders? Then from that vantage point, that changes everything. I, I, can I give you an illustration? Because I, I know as we go through this and we start talking about it a little bit more and deeper, um, we're going to miss the picture. When I was young, um, I had to go to work with my dad. Like, I, my dad was a slave driver. I don't know if y'all knew this. Um, I, when I was eight, I had to get up in the summer and go, like, at six in the morning. And during the summer, I would go on alternate days with my brother. We'd go to work. And my dad was a mean, mean slave driver. Mm, he was bad. Um, like, you're talking about getting, getting an eight-year-old boy up out of bed at six in the morning. And he'd ask me, like, Sonny, you're going to get up a shower? I'm like, uh-uh. He said, do you need to wash your hair? Yeah. As an eight-year-old boy, for some reason, my dad had a part, and I was going to have a part, and I was going to hairspray it, and I would do that until probably a couple of weeks of working with dad, I realized it was pointless to hairspray that stuff because I was going to sweat so much during the summer. We'd work in Greenville putting hardwood floor in, and uh, my dad was a mean slave driver. Mean, mean, mean. I would get up at five in the, or at six in the morning and going and driving down the car, and then he'd buy me breakfast, and he'd give me $5 a day to work with him as eight years old. Whew, man, he was a mean slave driver. All because he just wanted to make me work, right? No, it was really all because me and my brother fought. So, I don't know if I'd call him a mean slave driver. I think I'd say that uh, he was trying to, to save us and sanctify us just a little bit more so that we wouldn't give my grandma any more um, worries. But I remember, I remember when that happened. What do you do as eight years old on the job site? You know, you go with your with anybody, and you break an eight-year-old with you, you're more concerned that they're not going to, like, die because there's power tools, and my dad had those. I mean, he's got open blades. He, if he had a table saw, which OSHA can't get him now, so I can say this out loud, if it had a guard on it, he took it off, okay? He said that guard was going to kill him one day, so he took the guard off. He would have his, for some of his miter saws, he'd have the guard pinned up because he couldn't see if the guard was down. And so he'd take his thumb and roll it up, or he'd lock it out of position, and you say... Was he crazy? Well, he did cut three fingers off, okay? So maybe he shouldn't have. Uh, but I will give in all fair honesty. First of all, number one, the fingers got sewed back on. Number two, um, he drove himself to the hospital because the homeowner couldn't bear to, to see his fingers. So she's in the driver's seat as my dad's driving. I'm like, that was crazy. But the third part is it was also that was before he started taking guards off. Um, so since he took guards off from the later part of his life, he was okay. The Lord had given him some skill. So what do you do with a kid that's eight years old on the job site? You give him direction, and you give him a job to do. And so my job was pretty simple. Son, when we get to the job, you get the tools in, and then you sweep. You clean the floor, you put the paper down, and you make sure before I nail anything down, it's clean. And when I need nails in my gun, you put the nails in my gun. Now, this is before it was an air gun, by the way, so that you really couldn't hurt yourself putting nails in. It wasn't like putting a bullet in that could fire on you. It was... Somebody would have to hit it, and so but the, somebody that could hit it's over there. Even if I hit it, I couldn't have shot a nail out and save my life. And so my dad put me to work. And I remember during that whole time that he gave me just the clear instructions. Keep the floor clean and clean up after ourselves. Now, does that describe all that I did? did? No. That was his marching orders. That then, as we go through, if I gave you the, over the next 40 minutes, if I gave you a picture of everything I did on the job site with my dad, then that doesn't sound like simple instructions. Can I give you a perspective? That's what we're doing is we're going to what the church did and then eventually getting back and say, what was Jesus' marching orders? What are, what are the things that summarize all of this that says if Garner Field Baptist Church is going to meet the mission of the church, we have to go back to the basics. And that means we have to throw away some things that 
are not really what God intended. Amen? Like, I, I'm, I'm pretty big on this. I, I'm, when it comes to a business mindset, I believe in cutting the fat. Let's get away from the things that don't make sense and do with what does make sense. And, and I could say that, and we can all agree that says, yeah, yeah, you don't do that. Yeah, yeah, we need to, let's, let's streamline it. Let's do things right. Let's get the bureaucracy out of the church. Let's do this, let's do that. We can come up with all those great phrases until it comes time to actually say, okay, now we're going to cut that out. And you're like, whoa, preacher, are you really going to do that? I don't know. Are we? Are we going to hold faithful to what God's mission is or are we going to add all the extra things out here that we miss? And you say, Preacher, why on tonight are we talking about this? Why is that your introduction for tonight? Because we've been talking about this for about four weeks. And yet we haven't addressed it that way. Look with me in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 13, verse 20 is where we're going to be. 20 through 22. We've referenced the end of the passage, so I'm not going to go through that again. But verse 20 through 22 is our text for tonight. Now the peace of God that brought again from the dear from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Underline that phrase. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. And then verse 23, 20 through 25, if you feel like we've not addressed it, here it goes. All it says is this. Listen, I'm going to come to you again. Here's my salutations. Verse 25 is probably well worth mentioning now. Grace be with you all. Amen. Our question throughout the um, chapter 13 has been, what are the marks of a healthy church? And we've gone through those, and our list has become longer and longer, and so I'm not going to rehearse those again with you. But we've talked about loving, loving each other, and that we've got to have the biblical view of marriage, and that we have to embrace, um, pray for our leaders, and exalt our leaders, and biblical doctrine, and understanding what Jesus has done for us. But verse 20 through 22 give us our final caveat to this picture. It's so easy when I use the illustration at the beginning to talk about cutting the fat and we talk about bureaucracy is we want to talk about the business of the church. And what we really say when we mean the business of the church, we're talking about like the finances or the facilities and everything else. But the business of the church is not that. Now, don't get me wrong. We have to have those things, right? We've talked about it. We have to have... The, the finances and the we have to go through those things, which again, I can't really find a, a scriptural passage that says how you deal with the business in church because in, they, they didn't really didn't have money back then, okay? You, you get to the best pictures, the Old Testament when it talks about tithing, and it says everybody's to give 10% back and then give more in offering as God blesses you. And so, again, I can go to my, my tax return at the end of the year and I look and say I made this much money. Did I give this much to the church? No, I don't. Um, if I ever miss it, then at the end of the year, what do I do? I write another check. Why not? Because I want to know, am I at least got, the, the first 10% is not, am I giving? Can we, can we be honest on something for a moment? Giving to the Lord is not the first 10%. That's his. That's a, that's a part of being a Christian is that I'm giving the 10%. I, I don't know who gives and who doesn't. So if I look at you and you're like, does he know? I don't. I, I've, I've asked Miss Deborah not to share with me any of that information. I always want to be crystal clear that I'm preaching the word clearly and that she deals with that end of, of who does what, when, where, and why and make sure your tax returns look correct, okay? She takes care of that end. I don't. God's called me to be the spiritual shepherd, and I'm going to encourage. So when we talk about tithing, let me be very crystal clear. My 10% is not me being gracious to the Lord. Now, depending upon how much you make, that might feel like you're being gracious to the Lord because 10% is 10%. I, I get frustrated. Do you ever, when you got to eat, that it used to be 10% that you give to the waitress? You remember that? And then some reason they said now it goes to 15%. Somebody told me the other day it was 20%. And I'm sitting here like, hold up, how does that work? Percents don't change. When the price of food goes up, the percent is still more money, right? So if, if I went to Outback and that meal used to cost me $15, 10% was $1.50, and if all of a sudden now it costs me $30, it's $3. 
And so is she getting a raise? I don't understand where that changed. Now, you, you say that, Michael, you've never waited tables. You don't understand. I don't care. I'm just confused on why it changed. That's all I'm saying. I'm not faulting the waiter or waitress. I'm going to pay them what I feel like they're worth regardless. Amen? And that means sometimes my wife gets upset with me because I paid them what they're worth. Sorry. If you see my face up here and I haven't left you a good tip, I do apologize. Um, but you probably did a bad job. Okay, that was a moment of silence for those people who are probably upset with me right now. Um, I pay people what they're worth. Amen? Oh, man. <laughs> I got one guy with me on this one. Um, you almost have some people that you know that are waiters and waitresses, or you've been to a bad restaurant recently, you understand. Um, when it comes to the business of the church, though, what is the business of the church? Saving souls. The business of the church is that we're getting the gospel out and educating people of what they need to know. So this evening, I want to tell you our final one out of Hebrews 13 is one point. Man, this guy's great. One point sermon on a Wednesday night. We might get home and the sun still be outside. And it should be because it's summer. Here we go. Rely on Jesus. A healthy church relies on Jesus to perfect them. A healthy church relies on Jesus to perfect them. Now, like any other statement I give you, that's a deep one. And so we're going to walk through, literally tonight, keep your Bibles open. We're going to go through verse 20, 21, and 22, and we're just going to unpack the word as it says. So look at me in verse 20. It says, number one, we see Jesus began perfection with salvation. Number one, Jesus began perfection with salvation. Look at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Notice the first part. How does it describe the Lord? He is a God of what? Peace. Now remember, we talked about this um, in the Beatitudes. When we talk about blessed are the peacemakers, it's not those who are just saying, let's not fight, guys. No, 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 no. Stop bickering over this. Uh, which sometimes I feel like we've cowed down as believers because we, we take that word peace and we've pulled it out of the language and we don't understand what it means. And, and the peace here is referring to making peace with the Father. We, two side points that should be emphasized here is, number one, we should not enter into foolish arguments. Amen? But we should enter into reasonable arguments. It is okay at times to disagree with somebody. And you might get to the end of that and say, we are going to have to agree to disagree, but I have made my point clear. This is clear. Have you had that conversation with somebody since Roe v. Wade has been overturned? That all of a sudden they're, they're going through it and they're like, you're, you're this or you hate women or you don't understand or you're narrow-minded or you're this, and they start laying the charges out and I'm like, oh, bless. Which one do you want to deal with first? Do you ever feel like that in the argument? And I just came back to this simple truth. Life begins at conception, and anything that interferes with life is against God. Uh, that's my simple argument since Roe v. Wade's been overturned. Because people have gotten in their minds that, that all of a sudden it's something else, and I, I will gladly enter into arguments. But I'll tell you what, I'll stop them as soon as they become pointless. Uh, you, we've talked about that before. You've gotten into a conversation with somebody and you're, you're butting heads just because they don't want to agree to terms. And, and then we're sitting there arguing this and this and this. And we're back, back and forth. And realistically, we're talking about the same thing. I'll give you a funnier example of this. There, there's a color like called aquamarine or it's, um, it's to me, I, I, the best I can describe it is like a blue-green. And... My wife will refer to it sometimes as green. And I'll be like, but that's not green. I know what green looks like. I had that color in my coloring box. I knew what the crayon green looks like. I remember this. The grass outside is green. I understand green. That color, aquamarine, is not green. And she looks at me and says, but it's not blue either. And we'll, we'll, this has been like ever since before we got married, we'll argue this point. What color is it? Because she'll say it's green, I'll say it's blue, and, and we both are wrong. It's neither one. Now, I say that. She'll, she will still argue that it's green, and I will still argue that it's blue. That's a pointless conversation. And at a point, we have to agree that we're not talking about the same thing. Because it is neither blue nor green. It is a mixture of the two. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? 
that because we're butting heads over something because we can't agree to terms that we miss this. But when it comes to our salvation, we have to understand that our God is the chief peacemaker. He's called the God of peace in this passage that his goal is reconciling the world with him. How do we know that? Look, look at the verse. I don't want to get jump ahead of it, but it says, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. What was his goal in being peaceful? He did not just say, I want you to make terms right with me. I'm the one who did all the work. What did Jesus do for our salvation? Everything. Well, everything's a little bit too all-inclusive. I mean, come on now. Y'all have got to give me something here. He made it possible. But, okay, so he let, let, let's put it in theological terms for a moment. He, he died. He, he cast his blood on the altar for our sins. He paid the blood debt for us that we might have salvation. And he rose again showing that he had power over death. But do you realize, stop for a moment, that's not all he did for our salvation? Because if that's all he did, that, that's momentary. Jesus did not just die for our sins. He also lived in this world for 33 and a half years as a man separated from his father that he might be able to die for our sins. But, but that's not it. That's not all. But for my salvation to even occur, Jesus had to be born of a virgin, which can't happen, right? We agree with that. It can't happen outside of through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary. And God miraculously gave Jesus life. Matter of fact, I saw... This is just a little punchline in there, but I saw somebody this week that said the first one to recognize baby Jesus was another baby. So there is life in the womb, amen? Okay, let's not miss that. John is in the womb, and he recognizes that that one over there is something special, and they're sitting here communicating how whatever they did spiritually, I don't know, but if that doesn't give you goosebumps, that gives me some, so at least it did me. For, for salvation to happen, God had to do all of it ahead of time. If we took a scale out and, as, and we talked about our role of salvation and God's role of salvation, do you realize the scale's going to tip? That God did so much more for it than we ever did? Because look, he says, brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about that the God of peace made the way for salvation to occur. Now, that, that's important, okay? I don't know if y'all know this. Me, me and Billy have been arguing over things. I mean, he, he just doesn't like me. I'm sorry. It's just the way it goes. And so he's been arguing with me, and we've been bickering back and forth. And, you know, if we're going to get an arbiter between us, then we're going to get somebody. We haven't really been arguing for those who are confused for a moment, okay? But if we're going to get things right, we're going to get an arbiter between us. And so um, we'll, we'll pick an unfair arbiter. Bobby's going to be our arbiter between us. And so he's going to come in, and we're going to settle this out. And what we're going to do, if we're in a good arbitration we're going to try to make it where nobody gets what they want. I've done that before, right? That compromises the way you get out of arguments. Okay, I'll give you this if you give me this. And we, we try to negotiate our way out of it. But do you realize in salvation, the God of peace did not come to us and say, okay, I will make it a way for you to go to heaven if you do this. You remember back in the Old Testament with Abraham? Abraham's trying to get Lot out of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's in Sodom and he's deep and entrenched. And, and God tells him, said, listen, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill them all. Because they're sinful. They have defiled me in every which way. And if there's 50 righteous men in there, then I'll spare them. Only because Moses, I mean, Abraham's begged for them. And God knows. God knows how many righteous people are there. And then he drops it down and he says, no, I'll keep on, I'll keep on, I'll keep on. Finally, he brings it down to five. If there are five righteous men there, I'll spare the city. You know why God brought the level down to there? Because he knew there weren't five righteous men. He's bargaining with him, and God's giving up all the, the negotiating tools. Like, fine, you want it? I'll do whatever you want. Here it is. Let me lay it out. Because you know why we stopped at five and Abraham didn't go down and say, what about just one? Because in the end of the story, Lot might have still been righteous. Because Lot listened to the messengers, saved his family from them, even though he was willing to give his daughters up to the whoremongers in the city. He did all he could, 
And his wife was the one who had set her eyes back on it, and she burned up or turned to salt. And so had he argued it down to one, maybe God would have relented. But Abraham stopped at five because more than likely, that's how many family members at least that, that Lot had in the city. And Abraham was hoping that maybe Lot had at least reached his family. And the end of the story, he didn't get his wife right, and his daughters didn't get it right, and they created a worse sin out of it all. When we talk about the perspective of God making a role of peace, let me make it clear with salvation. He did it all. What do we have to do? Believe and receive. You say, Michael, but that's a big deal. Because if you knew where I was at before I got saved, that was a big deal. But do you realize that it wouldn't have been possible had Jesus not done all the work ahead of time for you? Why? God has not been the author of destruction. God is a jealous God. God does all these things of, of punishment and all of it because of his nature. And yet, despite his nature, he has gone over and above to make things right with him. Keep reading. He's not just God of peace. He hasn't just done that for Jesus, but says, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Ooh. Number one, we're talking about that Jesus didn't just save us to leave us alone. He saved us to perfect us. Does that make sense? And we've been learning a little bit about um, sheep because we bought a, not a sheep dog, but a herd dog in a Great Pyrenees. If you're not familiar with them, you need to just go, it's been interesting what we've been trying to learn about our dog because we need to know her nature, her what she's going to do, what she's not going to do, and make sure we understand how to train her but use her for what God has given her for. And Great Pyrenees were bred in the French mounts of the Pyrenees, and they were breeded for one purpose, to protect sheep. Because a Great Pyrenees is different than any other dog. Now you say this, Michael, I know a dog that will do this. Absolutely you do. Absolutely you do. But do you know a breed that by its very nature does this? No. Because the argument is anything, unless if it's breed, bred from the Great Pyrenees line, that they're just not that way. A Great Pyrenees dog will back down a black bear. I was watching a video the other day of it was a family that had them on a road trip. They got them out to give them some water and some food and let the dog just walk around. And before they got back on the road trip, the black bear comes out and is walking over because there's food and that's what black bears like. And as soon as it does, the dog runs over there, gets in the bear's face and starts barking. That bear is probably four or five or more times as big as that dog is. And as it's barking it down, it is doing everything it can to intimidate that bear, and that bear just goes back up in the woods and leaves. And I remember at the very end of the video, the, the dog, it's almost like it had a really good personality. It goes up to him and goes, Row! and turns around and walks off. And it's, like, it's kind of like us. We're like, ha, I got you on that one. And it's, it's interesting, as we've learned that about them, that they're, they're protector dogs, and they're meant to be for herds. Why is it significant? Because a good shepherd doesn't just put you out there and says, you're part of my sheep. He feeds you and he takes care of you in all of these ways. I don't know if you've ever gone through Psalm 23 and ever read the book about um, what a shepherd actually does for their sheep. But I'm going to tell you, sheep are dumb. Sheep will die over just eating out of the ground because they'll get parasites in their nose and if the shepherd doesn't recognize it, the sheep's dead. Like sheep, I don't know why we've even let them continue. You know, like if we just went with Charles Darwin's theory, survivor of the fittest, there would be no sheep. But there are because there are good shepherds. And I've learned this, the more I've learned about our great Pyrenees because they're, they're actually designed to be in sheep because they look like them when they're going throughout them. And so the predator comes in and all of a sudden the great Pyrenees comes out. Matter of fact, they have an extra claw or toe and that they're more capable of not just grabbing them, but grabbing them because of the extra toe behind them. It's interesting. you got to watch some of these studies that when they, when they do, that they can protect them and kill them or whatever it is, and then they won't kill the chicken. They do all those things, but it won't kill the chicken because it knows how to protect them. Our shepherd did not just save us 
for us just to have a good time on this earth. He saved us to protect us as a shepherd. How? Through the everlasting covenant of his blood that he made that salvation for us. Number one, verse 20, gives us clear. Jesus began the process of perfection through salvation, but he didn't stop there. Look at verse 21. But he completes perfection through sanctification. Verse 21, I told you to mark this phrase. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Woo! That one phrase will preach for hours. He will make you perfect. How? In every good work. Not the bad works, not bad endeavors you take on there. Which works? Not all works to do his will. We should be a church that is being perfected to accomplish God's will. Amen? That's not just a group of people. That's individually. Let's go back to revival for a moment. Let's get back in revival mode and realize something. God has designed you not to be stagnant on a pew, but to be growing until you die. You say, Michael, what, what am I supposed to do for the church? I don't know. I, mean, I can give you a task. I, but realistically, your goal is verse 20 to make peace with other people. There is not an age you get to that you cannot share the gospel with someone. Now, you might be like my grandma. My grandma, I loved her. She, she passed away at 89. She was 87 when we took her to a nursing home. And she was starting to have mini strokes. And every time she'd have mini stroke, we didn't know what was know what was going to come out of her mouth. And it eventually got to the point that affected her body. But to begin with, after she had a mini stroke, she would say things and you'd be like, who is this person? And it would emphasize her dementia as she would keep on. And I remember um, this is about a year before she passed away, so her mind had gotten a little worse. She had already thrown a knife at somebody at the dining room. And we're like, Grandma, you cannot do that. She said, I told him to catch it. <laughs> Grandma, you can't throw knives at people. I don't care. That's like me shooting a bullet and saying, I told you to catch it between your teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Great idea. I've seen that in the, the shows. Somebody should be able to do that. You should. Anybody want to try? Um, for the record, nobody raised their hand, okay? Um, just make sure nobody in here was that crazy. But if I, if I tell you that, you, that's that's her not being right in her mind. And so we go back to the, the counter and... Um, I've got her in her wheelchair and I'm pushing her and like, okay, she seems like she's, she's coming off of her mini stroke. So she's doing better. Right. You know, she just threw a knife. Maybe that's the end of it for the evening. And we pull up and she says, stop, stop, stop. I was like, okay, yes, ma'am. What do you want? She looked at the um, nursing aide and she said, Hey, do you have a piece of candy? And she said, no, Miss Esther, I don't. She said, well, get up off your, and use the wrong word for a bottom end. <laughs> and I, my face was turning red and get me one. Now, let me tell you about my grandma. I don't know if I've told you this. This is the lady who got my family in Bethel Church. She was the original out of our family charter member. She was the one who was there when they were downtown before they grew into a big church. She was faithful even when my mom and dad weren't completely faithful and were learning to grow in the Lord. She knew it. I've, this is her Bible, okay? I still preach from it because I love the heritage of what my grandma meant to me. And I was her favorite, so that makes a little bit of difference. But hearing those things come out of her mouth, that was not her. Any of you have ever gone through dementia or Alzheimer with family members, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, just don't, don't take it personal. They're about to say something, and it doesn't mean it. But, but what's the perspective here? It's that we are undoing, and we are different than what we should be. And even my grandma at that point, when she was getting worse and worse and worse. You know what's funny? When, her, when she was back in her sane state, she would cry and say, I wish this person would get saved. I'm not ready to leave this world because I'm worried about this family member, that them and their family are not going to be okay. And she would talk to those nursing attendants. And I remember one night I'm sitting in the chair. She had to power recliner, so I'd be tired at the end of work day. I actually probably played nine holes of golf before I'd go see her. And so I'm kicked back, and I'm half asleep, and my mom's taking care of her, and I'm just the chauffeur at this point for my mom. I remember being kicked back, and the nurse attendant came by, and she was saying, Miss Esther, you okay? And I remember her grabbing her wrist, and she said, I am, but are you? And the nurse attendant was like, are you okay, Miss Esther? She said, yeah, because I know that if the Lord takes me, I'm going to heaven. Are you? Woo! 
When, when are you done? When God says you're done. When are you perfect? When you get to heaven. Amen? Look at me. He'll make you perfect in every good work. He is working to make us perfect. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. That means what God is taking you through is to make you where he says, that's good. He is our, we are his masterpiece. We are the thing that he is working and shaping. The church it should constantly be under revision because we want to be more like Christ. And the day we get content in that individually is the day we need to close the doors and just go home and watch somebody else online. Because we're missing the picture. We are not here just so we can come and gather together and have a good group of people. We are here for a mission. We should be missional in what we're accomplishing because God has been missional the whole time. Because he wants us to be well-pleasing. That means we're not well-pleasing yet. Yes, we might be saved, but we are not sanctified. We might be saved, but there's all these other people out here who are not saved. We must be growing and be that masterpiece that pleases him. Keep reading. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Jesus is the one who will complete that good work in us. What that does mean? We have to be patient with people while God's working on them. Amen? We must be patient as God's working on them. My dad, he'll be all the illustrations because it's too close to Father's Day and his birthday's in August, so I'll probably talk about him more over summer than any other time throughout the year. But let me tell you about my dad. My dad was a master craftsman when it came to interior trim. I could take you to a house, if they had let us in, that he did eight-piece crown molding on a curved wall. You say, how did he do that? Very carefully. Um, and it started with two-by-sixes being ripped down and, and bolted to the ceiling so it could hold it. And when it was said and done, it was 12-foot ceilings, and you had crown molding that was that thick. And he, he handcrafted all these things. And I remember my dad asking one time, or when we're talking about jobs and somebody's saying, well, listen, can you come over to the spec house for me? He said, I can, but you won't like it. He said, what do you mean? I mean, my dad's turning down a job. I hope you're gathering that picture. He said, you're not going to like it. He said, because you can go hire somebody else. They'll be cheaper, and they'll get it done faster. And he said, well, why should I pay you more if you're going to take longer? He said, because when I get done, it'll be right. My dad never said it proud, like he was, like, arrogant, but he was proud. And they said, what do you mean? He says, I, what I'll do, you can pay me to do it, and I'll save you because your painter won't need any caulk. He said, just go take the painter, put it over my holes, and that's all you'll need to do. He said, when I get done, every joint will be tight, and if it's not you, call me, I'll come fix it. Because that's how my dad did his work. He was proud of it. And he was, he was working, and he would take his time, and he'd mold it and shape us. And you know what we want? We want God to just make us perfect overnight. I've been saved. This year will be 30 years in the Lord. And he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It might have took him just a week to make the moon and stars. But he's still working on me. I didn't get the rest of it. I do know the lyrics, but I didn't figure I need to sing y'all's song. He's still working on me. Why? Because God doesn't settle with imperfection. And if I'm his... Whoo, he is working on me. You know, sometimes that means I'm going through a hard time. And in this world, we look at it and say, man, if I wasn't serving the Lord, I wouldn't have to do that. If I, if I would just give over to the world's ways, I wouldn't have to suffer this way because, you know what, I'm struggling with finances, but we talked about tithing a while ago. If I had that 10% back, you know, I could do so many more things. You start thinking about how much you give to the Lord, don't think about it that way. But if you did, you're going to start second-guessing and saying, whoo, Man, I could have this. I could have that. But I've got Jesus, and he saved me. And 10% is not enough to pay him back for what I deserve. And God's still working on us to perfect us in all that we are. To verse 22, Jesus, um, Jesus expects perfection through exhortation. Jesus expects perfection through exhortation. It's interesting, at the end of this phrase, he goes in verse 22 and he says, and I beseech you. Let me, let me give the two 
qualifiers. It, it's kind of like you're getting in a conversation and you say, stop, stop. Let me, let me explain to you. I'm telling you this, and you, you give a, a reference to why I'm getting ready to tell you, and you should believe me. Okay, I'm going to give you information about mortgages. I, I was When I was with the credit union, I was working on my doctoral classes. Um, when I was at the credit union, I did mortgages and loans, okay? And so when somebody all of a sudden says, well, this, this, and they start talking about it, my ears perk up because I'm like, I know what we're talking about here. And so somebody says that, and I say, now listen, let me explain to you. I, was, I worked at the credit union, and I was there for two years, which isn't long enough to speak authority to anything, amen? But I went, was there in two years, and they were trying to promote me to be a branch manager because of how much I already knew. Now, I tell you that. Why? I just established authority on a topic. I give you a reason to listen, that I was good at what I did. Which, again, why? Why was I really good at what I did? Because they told me they'd pay me more money if I knew more. So I took tests. I read books. And I increased my salary by like 15000 over the year and a half that they gave me some increase. And I said, amen. You, you give me another test. I'll pass that one too because they're going to give me more money. Like, I, that's how I operate. And so I didn't really want to be those things. I just needed a job to pay the bills for a little while. And yet they did. But I gave you authority on why I could say it because I'm establishing that I was not a novice at these things. They moved me up faster than anybody else in the credit union to that year to date. I got lending limits within six months of being hired without any experience in the field. And that does not happen at the credit union ever. Now, it might now for whatever reason. But when I was there, it didn't. Now, why do I say that? It has nothing to do with anything. Don't come listen to me because I've been out of that for five years and I don't remember some of those things. However, verse 22, what did he say? I beseech you, brethren. He's drawing us back onto authority. Why? Number one, he's begging us. Get this. If you're going to understand anything else, get this, guys. Tension right here, right here. Focus on me. Brethren, I'm one of you. He could have said, I'm the pastor, you're the congregants, let me talk down to you and let me establish my authority above you. But he didn't do that. He actually said, brothers in Christ, I beg you, as one of you, get this. If you don't get the rest of it at the end of my letter, get this. Brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. Take time, not just to hear it, but take time to listen to the words of bringing you up. You know what he's really saying here? Do you want to grow in the Lord? Do you want to actually know more about the Lord and actually love him more and that you can say at the end of the day, I've done the best that God could be proud of me? Then I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. Whatever he's saying and suffer the word of exhortation is very vital to us because if we're going to suffer it, if we're going to allow that to occur into us, then we, we will grow and be perfect in what God wants us to be. What is the word of exhortation? We don't want to suffer it. I mean, suffering in this case is not let it be a burden upon you. It's saying take time to sacrifice for it. This is worth your time and what you're going to do. So understand the value of what I'm going to tell you. I had a guy years ago. I wish I'd listened to him. I didn't. Otherwise, I'd be like filthy rich. I had a guy years ago, I was sitting in Wendell at a coffee shop. And we had missions conference when I was a senior year in college. And I wasn't working a job because I didn't need to. I had my car paid for. I had money in the bank. And I said, you know what? I've worked 40 hours a week all three and a half years of college. My last semester, I'm not going to work. And then I was working the rest of my life. So, I mean, what was the difference? And I worked on the weekends with my dad in construction. But regardless, I said I wasn't going to. And I got to spend some time with guys that I've known for the rest of my life. I remember sitting down in a Wendell coffee shop and a guy looking at me and saying, listen, you want to make some money? I said, yeah. He said, I'm in this thing called e-commerce. Now, this is back in like 2002. Did y'all in 2002 know what e-commerce was? I didn't. I mean, I was doing well. I had dial-up internet when I went home. We had a little bit of better internet at the college and e-commerce, I was like, what do you mean? Somebody's going to buy stuff online? How many of you ever bought anything online? The Amazon delivery driver knows where our house is by heart now. They're like, oh, yeah, they're buying something again. Because we found out that, hey, we have Prime, and we can even get groceries delivered to our house for free through them. And we're like, well, this is great. 
Like, oh, two-hour delivery? I really need some coffee creamer. I'll wait two hours for that, and I don't spend any gas to go get it. And, yes, I've done that. I've done that, okay? Bless my heart. Could you imagine if 20 years ago I had gotten involved in e-commerce? He was telling me about it. It was a group of guys. As a matter of fact, it was a, it was a conglomerate of people that, listen, you can buy into, you'll have your own site, you'll get a domain name, and you'll just sell products on there. And he says, listen, you don't have any money you got to put up front. All you have to do is sign an agreement, we'll put your name with it, and then you'll get a check from it. Can you imagine if 20 years ago I'd listened to him? I, I look back and say, I didn't suffer to do what he told me to do. I didn't listen to him with wisdom. I listened to him like he was a crazy man, didn't know what he's talking about. Now he's probably rich and watching this thinking, ah, that was that guy, I remember him. Yeah, that was a sucker. He, he could have made billions of dollars, but I didn't. Guys, notice what it says, suffer. This is worth sacrificing your time over. What is the word of exhortation? He's referring to this entire book. Specifically in this one, he's talking about the letter of Hebrews. Suffer this word of exhortation. What would be scripture? Listen to it. Understand it. Know it. And make time to know it and do what it says. If we're not willing to give time to the word of God on a daily basis, why should we ever expect God to perfect us in where we're at? If we give anything over of what God has given us to do, number one is to pray, number two is to read his word. Look what it says. For I have written a letter unto you in a few words. I'm giving you just the important parts. Please take time to know it. Please take time to understand it. Can I give you a perspective? If we were all raised Jewish, I don't know if anybody here is technically Jewish by birth, but if we were all raised Jewish, do you realize that by the age of eight, we would have memorized the first five books of the Bible? They, they didn't have the, the scrolls or the scripture to take around with them all the time. And the Jewish community thought it so important that they knew the word of God that every child brought up in the Jewish community could recite from beginning to end the words of Moses, the Torah, the law, every bit of it. Now, can you imagine that? Let's delve for just a moment. I don't want to cheat y'all a page. Of the Old Testament... They would have memorized this much of this much. They would have memorized this much. In my Bible, that's 262 pages of recitation. Why do I emphasize that? It's important to know the word. Now, we're, we're privileged. We don't have to go to the temple and get a scroll and say, now what did he say over in this book of the Bible? We, we don't even have the privilege of just having it. We have the privilege of having it on our smartphone. We have Google searches. We have intelligent search engines where we say, where, where is that, that verse that says um, cleanliness is next to godliness? And then you go and you search and you realize, oh, it's not in there. Never mind. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? You, you, you All of a sudden you thought of the scripture, you type it in, and you're like, okay, where's it at? Well, instead of reading all of it, we at least can go to our computer and say, um, where's that passage that says, and we type it in, and all of a sudden now it gives it to us, and we're like, yeah, it's over here in this book of the Bible. You know, years ago, you couldn't do that. You couldn't fake it. You had to know it. Now we're like, I know where everything's at in Scripture because I got Google, and I can find it. But do you know it? That's like me, you saying, do I know your phone number? I remember the day where I, everybody, I could, I could tell you, I know that person's phone number, I know that person's phone number, and I still got some of them memorized. And then smartphones came about, and you really didn't need it. And I, truth be told, if I didn't have my phone and your number pops up, I won't know it's your number. Because it's probably 919 if you were born here. I don't know anybody necessarily that their phones were not originated here. So if it's a 919 number, I just make the habit of answering it, even if it's a spam caller, because it might be somebody in our congregation that has my number, and I don't have yours saved yet, Right? 
And so if you have a non 919 number and you call me, I might not answer it. Leave me a good voicemail, okay? But we know things differently. We, but do we know it? We know what God's Word says to a point, but do you know it? Do you spend time and let it know you and let it breathe in you? Why? For exhortation. You will not be perfected as God intended if you neglect the Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. I thank you for all you've blessed us with, and I thank you for your word. But, Lord, I thank you for your heart and your mission to perfect us. And, Lord, it's an effort that we have to suffer, we have to set aside, we have to put those moments so that you can speak to us in our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that you help us this week to dedicate more and more time to you that we might know your word. Lord, it's so easy through the summer that we neglect these things because we get busy. We've got more daylight, so we end up spending more time outside or we spend more time at the ball field or at events or at the beach or everywhere else, and we get so out of routine that we don't know your word, and we wonder why we drift away during the summer. Lord, help us to suffer to you to give time to your word. Lord, I pray you bless our kids this evening. I thank you for what you're doing in them and I pray for our workers, Lord, special hand of protection over them that they might be able to do your will and your work in all things. We love you and we thank you in Christ's name we pray.